This video is sponsored by Masterworks. More on that later. Caracalla's reign was characterized by cruelty in his private life and irresponsibility in his public life. He is another example in the Roman Empire of the perils of a son succeeding his father, where there is no guarantee of virtue or ability. Early Life Lucius Septimius Bassianus was born at Lugdunum, while his father Septimius Severus was governor of the province of Gallia Lugdunensis on the 4th of April 188. He took the name Bassianus from his maternal grandfather, Junius Bassianus, who was high priest in the Syrian city of Emesa. Septimius had married Julia Domna just the year before Bassianus was born. And in the following year, 189, they had another son, Geta. I will refer to Bassianus as Caracalla for the remainder of this video. Caracalla was a nickname he received based on a cloak he was using. The Caracallus was a short, close-fitting cloak with a hood of German or Celtic origin. Caracalla lengthened it so that it reached down to the feet. And this new type of cloak became so closely associated with him that he took his nickname from it. As a child, Caracalla is said to have been intelligent and sensitive, but it is clear even in his early years, and certainly by the time he reached his teens, Caracalla was caught up in jealous rivalry with his younger brother Geta. When Caracalla was only five years old, his father seized the imperial throne from Didius Julianus, and two years later, he had himself posthumously adopted by Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who had been dead for 15 years at this point. Septimius Severus wanted to legitimize his own usurpation of the imperial throne by linking his own dynasty with the previous one. As a result of this adoption, Caracalla was renamed Marcus Aurelius Antoninus and proclaimed Caesar, essentially making him his father's successor on the imperial throne. On the 28th of January 198, following his father's successful campaign in Parthia, Caracalla was proclaimed co-emperor with his father with the title of Augustus. In the following year, in 199, Caracalla was granted the title of Pater Patriae, father of the fatherland, making a complete mockery of the title, as he was only 11 years old at the time. In 202, Caracalla was forced to marry the daughter of Gaius Fulvius Platianus, Fulvia Plautilla, a woman whom he reportedly hated, though for what reason is unknown. Plautianus was a maternal cousin and longtime friend of Septimius Severus, and he had been elevated to sole Praetorian Prefect and was Severus's strongman. Fraternal Rivalry Gator was proclaimed co-emperor in 209 together with Caracalla and Septimius Severus. Septimius Severus and Caracalla had been campaigning across Hadrian's Wall against the Caledonian tribes. But when Septimius died on the 4th of February 211, Caracalla quickly made peace with the enemy, withdrawing from their territory and abandoning the forts. Hadrian's Wall had to be the frontier once more. A concerted attempt to claim that this had been Septimius's plan all along was made. As soon as Septimius Severus was dead, Caracalla began plotting to become sole emperor. He was bribing officials and troops to win their loyalty, but he was unable to win over the soldiers' complete loyalty. The soldiers' devotion to Gator was partly inspired by his very close resemblance to his father. At Ibaracum, Julia Domna made an attempt, backed by some of the imperial comites, to reconcile her sons. Caracalla made a show of agreement, and the imperial party hastily left the island. Herodian records the journey back to Rome. Septimius' sons, who were now young men, quarrelled continually on the return journey to Rome. They did not use the same lodgings or even dine together, since they were extremely suspicious of all they ate 
and drank. Each feared that the other would secretly get prior access to the kitchens and bribe the servants to use poison. In Rome, the palace was physically divided, and after the ceremony of deification for their father, the two emperors led separate existences. They even considered splitting the empire in two. Caracalla was to rule in the west, and Geta in the east. The months that followed saw a battle for support. A majority in the senate supposedly favoured Geta, who at least gave the appearance of being a cultivated person. Caracalla adopted the role of the rough, plain soldier. One thing that attracted me to the study of ancient Rome is the many stunning artworks that still remain largely intact, and how that visual language has impacted Western civilization ever since. One of my favorite examples is stamping the heads of leaders on coinage. In ancient Rome, one could find the profile of the current emperor on the coinage of the time, just like you can find Abe Lincoln on the penny. And interestingly, these Roman coins are still being found today, and selling for millions. The extremely rare gold version of the Eid Mar Denarius of Brutus sold for a record-breaking £2.7 million. That's why I'm happy to announce the sponsor of this video, Masterworks. Masterworks is the first platform for buying and selling shares representing an investment in iconic artworks. The total wealth held in art is estimated to be worth $1.7 trillion, and Deloitte projects it to grow $900 billion by 2026. Two-thirds of billionaire collectors allocate between 10 to 30% of their overall investment portfolio to art. Simply put, you can now invest in the very same art as billionaires do by names like Banksy, Monet, Basquiat, and other iconic artists for just a fraction of what they pay to purchase. Contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 total return by 164% from 1995 to 2020, according to publicly available data. And as the stock market has been crazy recently, in fact, nearly every top equity firm is projecting real returns of 5% or less. So diversifying your investment portfolio now is a great idea, according to the overwhelming majority of wealth managers. And as artwork has the lowest correlation to the stock market of any major asset class according to a 2020 report by Citibank, it's one of the best ways to diversify your investment portfolio. Masterworks have years of experience in the art market, and of course, past results are not indicative of future performance, but so far Masterworks has sold three paintings, with each returning over 30% net IRR to investors, and their new offerings usually sell out in hours. Getting started with Masterworks is super easy. It takes just a few clicks. You visit their website, create an account, browse their artwork, and buy into a piece you want to. Then you wait until Masterworks sells that painting. But if you don't want to wait until they find a buyer, Masterworks also offers a secondary market on their website where you can sell your shares to another member, similar to how you would sell stock on an app like Robinhood. It's similar to owning shares in a public company, but it's a piece of art. If you want to take advantage and invest in some fine art, there is a waitlist. But you can skip that waitlist and immediately start investing by clicking my link in the description. And it also really supports the channel. So, go check it out. Thank you. Now let's get back to the video. Reconciliation Caracalla called for a reconciliation meeting with his brother in their mother's apartment. When Geta showed up, Caracalla stabbed him to death in the arms of his mother. As his brother lay dead in the arms of their mother, Caracalla ran straight to the Praetorian camp. On entering the camp, he exclaimed, Rejoice, fellow soldiers, for now I am in a position to do you favours. He explained that he had narrowly escaped an attempt on his life and had killed Geta in self-defence. He promised them a pay rise and told them to rifle the temple treasuries for a massive donative. These bonuses and pay rise prompted him to further debase the currency. At the beginning of his reign, the denarius had a silver purity of around 55%, but in 
By the end of his reign, the purity had fallen to about 51%. In 215, Caracalla would introduce the Antoninius, a coin intended to serve as a double denarius. This new currency, however, had a silver purity of about 52% for the period between 215 and 217, and an actual size ratio of 1 Antoninius to 1.5 denarii. This, in effect, made the Antoninius equal to about 1.5 denarii. Caracalla eradicated all his brother's supporters, killing a large number of people, including the Praetorian Prefect, Papinianus, and orders went out all over the empire to obliterate the memory of Gator. His name was removed from inscriptions, portraits destroyed, and his name was removed from public documents. Mentioning his name was seen as a crime against the emperor. Geta's memory was systematically obliterated. His mother, Julia Domna, was forbidden to mourn her 22-year-old son. Cassius Dio records that she was not permitted to shed tears, even in private, over so great a sorrow. Constituo Antoniniana the most famous administrative measure of Caracalla's reign was the Constitutio Antoniniana, traditionally believed to have been announced in 212. By this edict, Roman citizenship was granted to all freeborn inhabitants of the empire. The leveling effect of this edict, in theory, subjected all free peoples in the empire to Roman law, though in practice, Local customs remained intact and proved difficult to eradicate. More importantly, financially, it broadened the base of the inheritance tax, paid by all citizens. One of the buildings most closely associated with Caracalla is the massive bath complex in Rome. It was inaugurated in 216, but the complex saw further construction and decorations during the reign of his successors, Elagabalus and Severus Alexander. It's often called the Baths of Caracalla, but the construction was likely initiated by his father, Septimius Severus. In 213, Caracalla left Rome. True to his father's memory, he set out for a military campaign, this time on the Upper Danube. The frontier was strengthened, and a new massive turf wall might have been constructed on the Ratian frontier at this time. Following the closing of the Marcomannic Wars, during Marcus Aurelius's reign, the northern frontier had been mostly quiet. Unfortunately, we know very little about his German campaign. A number of new milestones between the Rhine and Danube rivers indicate that the network of roads was repaired. What he achieved was perhaps a preemptive strike before any trouble could develop, and it seems to have been effective since there was peace for two decades thereafter. Caracalla took the title Germanicus Maximus following this campaign. In the East After the German campaign, he returned to Rome for a short time, where he had summoned King Adgar, whose land Septimius Severus conquered and left him with the city of Edessa. Caracalla imprisoned Adgar and seized his city, which was incorporated into the empire. He also summoned the king of Armenia, but was less successful in taking over the kingdom and met heavy resistance from the population. With these preparations, he was ready for a tour of the east. Caracalla idolised Alexander the Great and wanted to emulate his hero with a splendid campaign in the east regardless of whether or not such a campaign was necessary. He went the land route eastward. He stayed in Nicomedia for the winter of 214 to 215, and to fully emulate his hero's campaign, he raised a unit of phalangites. The Parthian Empire was still overwhelmed by internal strife and was unlikely to put up any substantial resistance to a Roman invasion. As Vologeses V and his brother Artabanus were at odds with each other, Caracalla hoped to take advantage of their weakness, using Edessa as a staging point for further conquests. But Vologeses diplomatically avoided all activities that would put him in the wrong with regard to the Roman Emperor, so Caracalla was hard pressed to find any casus belli. 
Before a war against Parthia could be justified, trouble flared up in Alexandria, which required his presence. Meanwhile, Theocritus was sent to campaign in Armenia. What the nature of the trouble in Alexandria was is unclear. Herodian records that the Alexandrians were making endless jokes about him. The people of that city are, by nature, fond of jesting at the expense of those in high places. However witty these clever remarks may seem to those who make them, they are very painful to those who are ridiculed. Herodian goes on. In reality, they were causing the naturally savage and quick-tempered Caracalla to plot their destruction. Once in Alexandria, he issued a public proclamation directing all the young men to assemble in a broad plain, saying that he wished to organize a phalanx in honor of Alexander, similar to his Macedonian and Spartan battalions. This unit to bear the name of the hero. He ordered the youths to form in rows so that he might approach each one and determine whether his age, size of body, and state of health qualified him for military service. Believing him to be sincere, all the youths, quite reasonably hopeful because of the honour he had previously paid the city, assembled with their parents and brothers, who had come to celebrate the youths' expectations. Caracalla now approached them as they were drawn up in groups and passed among them, touching each youth and saying a word of praise to this one and that one until his entire army had surrounded them. The youths did not notice or suspect anything. After he had visited them all, he judged that they were now trapped in the net of steel formed by his soldiers' weapons, and left the field, accompanied by his personal bodyguard. At a given signal, the soldiers fell upon the encircled youths, attacking them and any others present. They cut them down, these armed soldiers, fighting against unarmed, surrounded boys, butchering them in every conceivable fashion. So great was the slaughter that the wide mouths of the Nile and the entire shore around the city were stained red by the streams of blood flowing through the plain. After these monstrous deeds, Caracalla left Alexandria and returned to Antioch. In the meanwhile, Theocritus's campaign in Armenia had been disastrous, and the internal strife in Parthia had ended, leaving Artabanus V as sole ruler of the kingdom reinstating a degree of stability in Parthia. But instead of mounting a quick campaign into the still reeling Parthian Empire, Caracalla tried to negotiate a marriage between his daughter and the son of Artabanus. This offer was initially politely refused, but when Caracalla insisted and sent a large number of gifts, he eventually relented. Caracalla invited Artabanus and his household to meet to discuss a permanent peace and the historical marriage that would bind the two empires together. Upon meeting, the Parthian king and his retinue put aside their weapons as a sign of goodwill. Caracalla, however, seized this opportunity and ordered his forces to massacre them. Most of the Parthians present were killed, but Artabanus was able to escape with a few companions. Cassius Dio describes how Caracalla now ravaged a large section of the country around Media by making a sudden incursion, sacked many fortresses, and dug open the royal tombs of the Parthians and scattered the bones. The Parthians had retreated to make preparations and refused to meet the Romans in battle. The area of operations seems to have been limited to northern Mesopotamia and the pro-Parthian kingdom of Adiabene. As such, this may have been intended more as a demonstration of Roman power than a serious attempt to conquer Parthia. However, Caracalla sent news of his victories in Parthia to the Senate in Rome and was promptly awarded the title of Parthicus Maximus. The Romans returned to Edessa for the winter of 216 to 217. On the 8th of April 217, Caracalla was travelling to visit a temple near Carai. While stopping on the roadside to relieve himself, he was killed. Rumours had begun to circulate, foremost among them the prophecy that the Praetorian Prefect Macrinus would succeed Caracalla. The Emperor heard it, and Macrinus began to fear for his life. At least, that was the story after he had murdered Caracalla. 
final thoughts. Caracalla emerges from the written record as a vainglorious and delusional individual. The idolization of Alexander the Great is certainly nothing new when it comes to glory-hungry Romans, but he took that practice further than anyone by organizing a unit of phalangites to emulate his hero's army composition. Regardless of the fact that that mode of combat had been eclipsed by the Roman legions themselves, he has often been regarded as one of the most bloodthirsty tyrants in Roman history. His slaughter in Alexandria and the ruthless murder of Geta and all his supporters certainly lend credence to that assessment. In the many portraits of him, the expression of force and cruelty is obvious, and some sources say that he intentionally reinforced this impression because it flattered his vanity to spread fear and terror. But if Caracalla was a madman or a tyrant, that fact had no great consequences for his administration of the empire, which may have been practically maintained by Julia Domna and the great jurists who surrounded him. The empire was still prosperous and strong enough to persist even with a largely incompetent ruler. But the cracks have already begun to appear. Caracalla is said to have scorned luxuries and often marched with the men, and sometimes even carried the legionary standards. A very heavy burden, even for the strongest soldiers, this won him the men's admiration. For a small man, the performing of such efforts was praiseworthy. Thanks for watching the video. Like and subscribe to the channel to not miss any of our future uploads. And remember to check out Masterworks in the description of the video and diversify your investment portfolio. The next video in this series will be on Macrinus.